So we're continuing our conversation with Dr. Walter Kaiser. I've got a question to kick us off, and it's about the Antichrist, the person of the Antichrist. There's been lots of theories throughout history, anywhere from the Pope, and our dear brother Joel Richardson yesterday has a theory about the Islamic Antichrist. What's your position on who the Antichrist is? Or what kind of person he is, or not the name of the person. No, no, not, not, not the name of the person. No, the pedigree, or whatever. <laughs> is, it, is, it the problem? is it an Islamic antichrist? Is, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. is it a Jew? Is it a... <laughs> they want me to name the. <laughs> <laughs> I think my British friend does. I'm not sure. Only on camera. No, no, only not. On only on camera. No, he's not. He's, I think you're saying, like, what kind of pedigree, what kind of background does he have? I'm, I'm not saying Obama is the antichrist. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm asking what kind of pedigree. It, because, you know, a lot, a lot in Protestant history, it was the Pope who was the antichrist. Well, he has a bad pedigree. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of antichrists have died already. Because First uh, John says that there will come many antichrists. Uh, and the antichrist will come. And already many have come. So... Uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Mao Zedong, and Idi Amin, and Khomeini, Gaddafi, I think they all qualify. So I'll, I'll enter their names, but they're not the Antichrist. Who that guy is, <laughs> it depends on which political party you're in. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's asking, like, is Joel is really strongly convinced it's, he's Islamic mostly, and he's asking, does that seem right to you, or do you have another thought of that, or something like that? You don't have to answer related to Joel, but just do you have any feeling about the general description of it? Well, I think Joel is a good place to begin because in uh, chapter 3, he really gives four reasons why uh, indeed, God is going to bring the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is uh, probably not a 24-hour, but it, it is that period of time connected with the second coming of the Lord. And he says, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, that day of the Lord is going to come because you've scattered Israel all over the world, number one. Secondly, you have uh, divided up his and partition the nation. That's uh, the second reason. And uh, uh, thirdly, you have taken the uh, vessels dedicated to the Lord and you're toasting Marduk. Uh, remember at that uh, uh, banquet in, in which, uh, yeah, Daniel chapter 5. And they're uh, uh, toasting Marduk on the very night in which without, uh, uh, excuse the expression, a shot being fired, they, uh, the enemy walks right in and takes over. And on the wall, meany, meany, tekel, upfarsim. And he says, I don't know. And the queen mother comes in and says, oh, there's a guy here, uh, one of the captives, uh, Daniel. And uh, uh, Daniel explains it to him and says, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. This night God will take the kingdom from you. So that is a sort of a, a, a forerunner of what is reasons. going to come. There's a fourth reason. You gave three. I gave three? Yeah, maybe taking I captives. I think of the fourth I think one. taking captives, Israel's captives and yeah, that, That's right. <coughs> You read the same book? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure it's it was right. Joel, yeah. the, that's the fourth reason. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've taken uh, uh, people and sold them yeah, right. uh, to other nations. Yes. Yeah. So it's clearly, he it gives four reasons uh, uh, why indeed that day of the Lord is going to uh, uh, come. But uh, there's so much more. I mean, the uh, Lord gives us some hints, but he doesn't have to tell us the whole scoop. Uh, that's going to be uh, made clear as history makes it clear. I still say John 13. I've told you this before it comes to pass, so that when it does come to pass. So history is the final interpreter, and uh, it always points to Jesus as being the true revealer of what the past and future is all about.
So I don't know. Do you have a contribution on that? No, I'm, I'm stealing all. No, no, of I'm your just trying. I'm getting this stuff so for my okay. next hand now. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. So it help with your question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, so a related question to that is a lot of people put a strong emphasis on geography and say because of the patterns, the Antichrist should come out of probably Turkey or Syria or some region. Do you think there's some um, validity to some of that, or we just don't know? No, I think we're guessing when we try that. Uh, we're guessing in light of present day possibilities, and that presumes we're closer to that day than uh, okay. what it really is. So again, I, I would think we ought to hold our shots on that and not say. I mean, uh, there was that uh, book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back on September uh, 12 and 13. And uh, uh, my secretary got all kinds of calls. She finally came in and she says, I put her hands on her hips. She says, I'm going to quit if there's one more call. I said, Lois, you've been here 30 years. What's wrong? She said, well, they keep saying, would the academic dean tell us whether Jesus is coming back on September 12, 13, what was that, 1988? Yeah, I think it was 88, yeah. And I said, Lois, get a pad, and I'll give you a, a note. She looked at me over the top of her glasses, and she went and got her pad, started taking shorthand. I said, concerning Jesus coming back on September 12, 13, 1988, I have the following comment. She looked at me now really cross-eyed, and I said, I said, no, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll give you the rest of it. I said, I will make a definitive statement on September 14th. <laughs> she threw her pad down and said, honestly, uh, with her hands on her hips and left. So I didn't give her satisfaction. But at, at any rate, uh, that book's on sale now. So, uh, but do you, do you have any comment on, I mean, this is a continuing trend, so recently it was September 23rd this year, and then it was September 30th, I think they then put it back to, but in the dispensational camp, Jesus is always coming back next Thursday. Do you, coming from that background, do you have any comment on, on that approach to, to predictive prophecy? Yeah, I, Jesus said no one knows the day nor the hour. And that's why some of those guys say, yeah, but he didn't say the year. I mean, how wooden can you get? I mean, if you're gonna to try to deal with someone that way, uh, just say, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, just depart from them and, and shake the dust off your feet. <laughs> uh, that's all that I know. But uh, at any rate, uh, there have been all kinds of uh, of guesses and still continue to be. The only thing is we know the character. Uh, therefore, while I remember speaking in inter varsity groups and where was I? Up in the, uh, northern Minnesota and, and at Duluth, I guess it was. And, and uh, I said, uh, I was talking about this and all through the audience, they were guessing at that time, the Secretary of State, that he was the uh, new Antichrist. I could hear his name being echoed through the, the hall. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, I finally said, no, no, you're guessing wrong, because it says his desire is not toward women. Uh, and this guy who was in there at the time had a bad record. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 no. Your comments on that sort of thing. You know. Yeah, I think your word baloney earlier was the main word. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know what the Hebrew form of that is. <laughs> yeah, I tell people I'm not interested in knowing who he is. Until he appears on the world stage and declares himself as God, the abomination of desolation, I said, I'm, not, I'm not concerned with who he is. And the focus should be on the Lord yeah. rather than on the evil guy. Right, right. right. So uh, we need to readjust the focus. Totally. Yeah. One of the big arguments the all-millennial camp has against premillennial 
is that John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel. Everyone will hear my voice, and the graves will open, some in a resurrection of judgment, some in a resurrection of life. And so it appears that when Jesus' voice is heard in John 5, 28 and 29, the ju- resurrection of the, ju- of the just and the, and, the, and the damned are at the same time. Then Revelation 20 comes and separates those resurrections by a thousand years. And then they use the Revelation chapter 20, I think it's verse 4, where it says, And they lived and reigned, and they met you talking about, we think, I think, millennial, uh, I mean, the martyrs were raised and then they reigned. And what the all millennials would say is, they lived means they're born again. And so the point being, all millennials says you can't separate the two judgments by a thousand years like you premillennials do, like Revelation 20 does, because Revelation 20 is kind of symbolic. It doesn't really mean they came alive and reigned. It means they were born again and they began to reign in life. So that's one of the premier arguments of all millennialism. So what would you say from a scholarly point of view about those, the John 5 judgments and then the Revelation 20 verse 4, the verb they lived? First, don't base a doctrine on one verse. Second, hear Paul on a teaching passage in 1 Corinthians 15 oh, right. and uh, verse 22. For as in Adam all die. How do you italicize in the pulpit when you're preaching? Shake your voice. As in Adam all die. Okay. That means italics. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just giving you some hints. Yeah. Uh, but he says, as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ, now how do you say that? Well, my pastor said it, as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ. And then he went as fast as he could, told me my life. I ran the words together, told me my life. But no, 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 no. He should have said, as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. But there's... There's no punctuation in uh, uh, Greek, so let's put a comma there instead of a period. But, verse 23, each in his own platoon, tagmati, the Greek word there is a squad, a division. So now we're going to get divisions. Uh, Christ, the first fruits. Uh, when Christ came forth from the dead, he is the promise of all other resurrections. So. I'm looking forward to being resurrected uh, if uh, I have uh, died before the Lord comes back. Then, he says, uh, uh, when he comes, those who belong to him. Oh, the word then is ete, uh, and then he follows verse 24, then and then. Those two words go together in Greek, always. They're like love and marriage, horse and carriage, then and then. So he says, uh, then Christ first fruits, first squad, second squad, those that are Christ that is coming. Third squad, uh, verse 24, where he goes on to say, uh, and then the end will come. The end what? The end group. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, all authority, and all power. For he's got to reign. Little Greek particle day. It, it's absolutely a must. It, he's obligated to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything he has put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. So we have here a promise of a three resurrections, Christ. Then there's a time gap. The word then indicates a period of time. Uh, let me give you another illustration of the use of ete, epete. First, the blade, 
and then the ear, and then the full corn does appear. So if you're talking not about uh, new world corn, but old world, which is uh, grain. So what comes up? The blade, first the blade, and then the stalk of the wheat or the oats or whatever it's going to be comes up, and then the full grain comes. So then and then. Uh, this makes an amillennialist blanch. He knows that it has time period between the two, and therefore Christ, his resurrection's already taken place. We'll all agree on that. And then those that are Christ is coming. But separated from that is the dead end kids who don't believe. So then and then. And that really speaks of a separation between the two resurrections. So you would use this First Corinthians 15 passage to interpret the John 5.29. You'd separate it because, because they don't like it. Passage. They want that 5.29 to be together because yeah. then they can get rid of Revelation chapter 20. They want to, but uh, they're getting in trouble because they are uh, taking one verse to interpret a teaching passage like Revelation 20 or 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, that, I think that's the good place. Then in Revelation 20, where it says in verse 4, they came alive, thinking of the martyrs, is what, is what it's talking about. They'll say, no, they're not talking about the martyrs. At, you know, at the end, uh, they're talking about people becoming born again. That means they're born again. And that's how they make Revelation 20 all about the church age. Except they, in the same verse, they say the second time it occurs, that's a resurrection of uh, all the dead. So they make one uh, spiritual born again, and the second one they make for a literal resurrection. Oh, one spiritual and one's literal, all yeah. in verse 4. All in one verse. Okay, so that's the, they're that's, hoping you don't t find that out. That's tough to swallow. Okay. And, and, uh, if you see any amillennialist in line on the final day, uh, when we're standing in line, just in the other I'll line, go uh, uh, it'll just go faster in the other <laughs> line. <laughs> <laughs> that's a prize for being here today. <laughs> I love it. That's great. So Dr. Kaiser, just uh, in that in that same vein, though, what about those that during the millennial kingdom uh, receive Christ? What body do they come with? You know, if, are the thens really that distinct as, you know, the first being Christ himself, the second being the redeemed, um, and then the third being, who is that third? Does that also include other believers that come to Christ during the millennial kingdom? Uh, no. Uh, here is on the topic of resurrection. So with regard to resurrection, there are three. And there is the one that sets the the type or what the whole thing is going to be, Christ, who is first fruits. And that means the promise of the whole thing. My dad gave me a garden when I was a young guy, and I liked sweet corn. So I planted a lot of sweet corn, and I kept feeling it for, you know, uh, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89 days. But so were the red-winged blackbirds. They were around <laughs> smelling that the milk was coming up and they were going to dive down. So my father says it's not professional to take a peek, to peel down to, and squeeze it to see if the milk was in it. You do it by feel. But one day I felt one cob and I was sure. So I pulled that cob, took it into my mother, she put on hot water, got it boiling, and then put the cob in for just a minute, minute and a half. No more. Don't cook the life out of it. This is fresh corn. Uh, and so then I went and sat out on our porch. And uh, I tell you, I smeared butter on it, about a half inch thick, <laughs> and salted it. They're going to find out butter's good for you, and salt also. So I poured a lot of that on, and I ate that. And I looked out at the garden, because this was first fruit, the promise of the whole harvest that was going to come. It was sweet. It was mm. sweet. Uh, and uh, 
the blackbirds, uh, uh, I uh, uh, got after them too. They're sitting up on the chicken house roof and uh, saying some words, I'm sure, about me. Uh, so I took a switch and hit the roof and uh, uh, I got one of them. But at any rate, uh, uh, first fruits is really important. But I argue this is a resurrection chapter. On your people, yes, apparently there are some that are born again. What happens to them? Uh, I don't have information. Now there's some people that do, but I don't. Yeah, I think more distinctly, let's say we're in the millennial kingdom, two, three generations have passed, a baby is born, that baby is me. I'm now 45 years old. I'm living in the millennial kingdom. After the return of Christ, I die, right? Will, will I die or will I just continue forever? I would assume that I would die, being that I'm immortal. What, do that's I a, get a resurrection? That's an assumption. I don't know that. You've got new information. Do I get a resurrected body or do I... What happens to me if I'm born after the return of Christ? Look, we've trusted the Lord so far. Can't you trust him for that? <laughs> Give him a piece of sweet corn to see what happens. <laughs> Dr. Kaiser. What, That's a good question. He, I mean, I think he has a good question. Is it possible that there are actually millennial believers in that final resurrection in Revelation 20 because it mentions some going to judgment and some going to eternal life? So is it possible that Isaac will get resurrected in the millennium? Let's not use me as a <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? Do you have information? I'm just going on Revelation 20. That's all the information you, I got. There, there's such a thing, or is there? Maybe you would object to this. What's that? But what would be called a necessary inference? I know that's getting you on shaky grounds, but if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, one, there's one axiom, and that is this mortal must put on. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if we believe that the scriptures are literal, that in the millennium there are people who come to faith, they're in their mortal bodies, and even some, a sinner, a hundred years, and we know there's longevity and all that, but death still happens and so forth, well, you've either got a choice, it seems to me, that you either spring right up with a new body or you get a new body when the next great revelational moment comes, which is the, the new heavens. In other words, you're going into the perfect state and you're not going to go into it with this present mortality. There's got to be a change. So where are you going to put the change? It seems there's only two choices. One is somewhere along the millennial road there uh, where people spring right up uh, with a new body or... There is another uh, revisitation of resurrection at the end of the millennium. Well, I like the fact that you uh, grounded in a theological proposition. Uh, there is inference in the Bible. Uh, for example, in Leviticus 10, Moses' two sons offer strange fire, but there was no indication in the text that what they were doing was wrong. But apparently there is an inference. And the same thing too, Jesus held with regard to uh, the uh, he, uh, resurrection. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's an inference too as well. On the same subject where you have doctrinal basis. So, if we agree that there might be a foundational biblical teaching and still understand it's inferential, then I would be willing to entertain that as a possibility. But still, I can't drive that as a solid teaching. It, you wouldn't be necessarily smuggling in that kind of case. I think a good example would be the one we just made. Um, about Nicodemus. There's no particular passage in the Old Testament that said specifically an individual must be born again. But Jesus was reprimanding this master in Israel for not inferring. Yeah, but I would argue that Ezekiel 36, new heart, new spirit, he should have gotten it from that. And I agree, but that's the eschatological great day when the spirit will be poured out upon the surviving remnant. And here he's saying you should know that that rule that applies there applies here. Are you a teacher in Israel and haven't you made the connection that if a nation cannot enter the kingdom without spiritual new birth, 
how can it be otherwise for the Why do you make it eschatological? Because the larger context? Or? Yeah, yeah, because when you speak about a nation being born a day, that's the day of the Lord in the context of Isaiah 66. When you speak about the cleansing and the washing uh, or the uh, sprinkling of clean water in Ezekiel 36, which he also references, those are eschatological day of the Lord pass. They are post-tribulational passages. So, so there's, I'm just making the point that there's no specific scripture that says, I know that's, you know, and I don't, I don't like people invoking things like this to start smuggling. I agree with you there, but but there are those times when there seems to be a, a, a reasonable, even a necessary inference that the that the Lord, because of a foundational teaching, not some leap of faith, but yeah. So. Well, is it Isaac? Did I hear you say? Yes, Isaac. Yeah, you may be okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're praying for you. So I got another question. Yes. Uh, another one. We got time. No, we'll get one more question. Okay, the <laughs> Revelation 3.10 to the Church of Philadelphia. If you overcome, you will escape that you'll be kept from that hour. And so how is that a promise to the people of that day? And then how is it a promise to the people at the end of the age? Just because you know, that's a total, you know, uh, I mean, a major uh, pre-trib thing. Yeah, th yeah, it's the go-to for the pre-trips, but it was a promise to the Church of Philadelphia, uh, to, to them specifically, and it has some eschatological, so just talk on that for a moment, that well, particular verse. You say we're over time? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Yeah. That is the key passage that the uh, 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 dispensationalists use for a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, but it is only that you'll be kept from the hour and the similarities of uh, escaping the onslaught, onslaught of uh, suffering. Uh, whether this was particularized to the Church of Philadelphia. Because they had that 10 day dimension to it as well. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's a hard, hard uh, verse. That's fair. And uh, That's fair. if there's any that uh, gives them any ground to stand on, that would probably yeah, right. be the one right. that uh, would stand on. But uh, I, I have always a, thought... But then it's not a promise for Philadelphia itself, then. If it's for the church at the end of the age, then it really wasn't a true holdout promise, I mean, offered promise to them in that day. Yeah, but no more than the other seven churches, uh, which uh, were at once both for them and yet pointed right. to uh, the future. So you have a now and not yet aspect to all seven of the churches. Yeah. So, well, it's a delight to uh, share with you. I wanted to hear from these guys, but they wisely... Uh, to ask questions. We hear from these guys all day long, so <laughs> we, we came to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, we hear from these guys all the time. Well, yeah. it's, it's a special uh, privilege, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, if I've said something incorrect and you find out the Bible doesn't agree, then I'm for what the Bible says. So I'm going to change right away. Uh, but uh, uh, that's our guide. And we need to speak to each other kindly. We don't know it all yet. Uh, we uh, see through glass uh, darkly. And uh, we get bits and pieces of it right, especially of the future. But the main thing still remains, the King of Glory. He himself will appear in all his radiance, and I tell you, it will be a champion of the uh, right way and uh, justice and mercy and uh, uh, kindness. So may God uh, bless each of you in the ministries you're in or that you're looking forward to, and may it redound to his honor and glory. These are great days, and there is an awful lot that is happening. Ours is the first generation, I believe, that has seen 
some of the predicted things that our grandparents would have loved to have seen. But they're on the docket right now, which makes us doubly vulnerable if we don't pay attention to them and where they are pointing in like our day. We're doubly vulnerable for not watching those things the Bible said. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Well, we ask the Lord's blessing on you tonight, just resting because you got a full day tomorrow and we're looking forward to it. I mean, Friday and Saturday. Yeah. So thank you. So hopefully tonight, Lord, release the spirit of grace and yes. peace upon him and his beloved wife and just visit them with strength and encouragement in this time of rest tonight and preparing to speak your heart to us tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.